So the Frank Sterling mechanism is essentially looking at the heart's ability to change its force of contractility and therefore the stroke volume, right? Because contractility will, Im will influence the stroke volume and doing this all based on the preload. And we already kind of talked about this, right? So as I have increases in venous return, that's synonymous with an increase in preload, right? And that increased venous return going to the right atrium is eventually gonna get to the left ventricle. So I'm gonna end up with a higher left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure. That increase in the end diastolic volume is going to allow for more myocyte stretch prior to contraction because I'm accommodating more blood. That's going to increase sarcomere lengthening, okay? Increases in active tension and velocity of fiber shortening. When I contract, there's more tension, there's more speed in the contraction, that's causing the increase in contractility. So again, that's how the preload is actually related to the contractility. That's what we were kind of talking about. Now, the Frank Starling curve uh, goes kind of out of its way to depict this. And so let me just kind of give you an idea of what this looks like. And you know, you don't have to know a ton about this. If you understand this mechanism, it's not super difficult to understand the curve. Okay, so let's put stroke volume here. Okay, we've got stroke volume on the y-axis. And then we're gonna have our left ventricular and diastolic pressure here. Now you can put left ventricular and diastolic pressure, you can put left ventricular and diastolic volume, you can put preload, you can put whatever you want. Here, we already said a lot of this stuff is gonna be synonymous. This means you can put fiber length, because remember, as you have more preload, you have more stretch, you have increased myocardial fiber length. So, but in any case, what we're talking about here is we have some curve. So as the left ventricular and diastolic pressure goes up, or as the preload goes up, what's gonna happen? The stroke volume is gonna go up, right? It's gonna go up. And eventually there's gonna be some point where this will level off. Okay, we won't go into too much detail on that, but this is the general curve. This is what you wanna know. So at any point along this curve, right, if I have more venous return, so let's just say I have higher venous return, higher venous return. How would I get higher venous return? Well, maybe we'd have venoconstriction, right? I'd be able to constrict the venous side. That would cause more venous return. That would cause this point to go somewhere over here maybe. Okay, so that would be an increase in venous return. If I had a decrease in venous return, this would be if I gave somebody nitrates, right? Or if I had a patient that had hypovolemia or a low central venous pressure, okay? Central venous pressure associated with the right atrial pressure associated with the venous circulation, okay? So if I had a really low venous return, for example, I might be somewhere down here, okay? And again, this should make sense to you, right? Because I have a lower venous return, a lower left ventricular and diastolic pressure preload, fiber length, I'm gonna have less stroke volume. That's the concept, okay? It's just depicted graphically. Let's say I put uh, contractility into the mix. So if I said, okay, what if I increased the contractility by using you know, epinephrine? Let's say I gave my patient epinephrine and that's gonna increase the contractility, okay? Or I can give the patient digoxin. Remember, that's another classic one. If I give the patient digoxin, these are going to increase the contractility. So if I give the patient these drugs, what's gonna to happen to this curve? Well, let's just start with our normal point here. Where is it gonna go? Well, if I give them uh, something that increases contractility, it's going to increase the stroke volume, right? So for a given left ventricular and diastolic pressure, it will increase the stroke volume. So it's gonna get me somewhere here. And that's true at all of these different pressures, right? That's true for all of these. If I increase the contractility, it's going to move the curve up, okay? So if I increase contractility, it will move the curve up because I'm gonna have more stroke volume at a given pressure. How about if I decrease the contractility? If I decrease the contractility, then the curve would move down, right? That's the concept. And I'm not gonna draw it here because I don't wanna make it too complicated. Okay, so now what about afterload? What if I said, you know, let's give the let's give a patient, uh, you know, hydralazine. Okay, and we already said what does hydralazine do? Primarily, it's going to be an arterial vasodilator. So it's going to decrease the total peripheral resistance, right? It's going to decrease the afterload. How will a decreased afterload affect the stroke volume? It will increase the stroke volume, right? So for a given left ventricular and diastolic pressure, it will increase the stroke volume. Same thing we saw with contractility, right? It's gonna get you up at a higher stroke volume for a given preload. So if I decrease the afterload, I'm gonna end up on this curve as well, 
Okay, so I'm gonna get a leftward shift if I increase contractility or decrease afterload. And conversely, right, I said I could always, I can also draw a curve down here, and that would represent a decrease in contractility. I'll put a decrease in C or an increase in afterload. Okay, because it would just be a lower stroke volume at a given end diastolic pressure. So that's the concept. So just to recap that here, okay, so the x-axis is what we saw here. That's primarily going to be, you know, associated with the preload. The y-axis is primarily going to be associated with the stroke volume. The slope of the curve is going to be defined by the afterload and contractility. Okay, so I might have a higher sloping curve, right, if there's a higher contractility or a lower afterload. The point along the curve, the point that we're at when we looked at these green dots here, the point along the curve is defined by the venous return. More venous return, higher stroke volume. Okay, so that's the concept of the Frank Starling curve. That's what all this stuff is talking about. So to summarize this, anytime I have a graph in any question, and I'll definitely talk about this in the next video where we have lots of graphs. Anytime you have a graph, look at the x-axis, look at the y-axis, and just think about it intuitively. You don't have to memorize all this stuff. If they say, hey, I gave this patient a drug that increases contractility. Well, you're probably expecting a higher stroke volume then, right? If you're, if you're increasing contractility, the stroke volume is gonna go up. So if they gave you a curve that was lower, right, than the, your baseline curve after giving a drug that increases contractility like digoxin, you know that's not the right answer. You know it's gotta be a curve that's gonna have a higher stroke volume in general because you increased contractility. So that's kind of the concept. So think about it intuitively. Don't panic when you see curves. Look at the X and Y axis and try and figure out does my answer make intuitive sense with what I'm seeing.